Um, if, ooh, next data Jacob posted in the chat. Um, if you don't feel comfortable being recorded, um, best way to not be on the recording is to keep yourself muted. If you have any questions, you can put them in chat. Chat is never published. Um, we like to keep that anonymous. So um, there's that. Uh, so um, getting started with today, we're so excited to have a January meetup. Um, I'm sorry that I'm not Joe, but Joe said, hey, Mariah, do you want to help out with the meetup? And I said, yeah, of course. So here we are um, starting out with announcements. Um, UDEM has officially um, joined the Ford Utah Foundation, which is just a meetup pro group, essentially. But um, there are some cool benefits. Um, there's a Slack group that has great conversations. Um, we do have the Meetup Pro with that. Um, any, uh, all of our events are posted on Twitter and LinkedIn and all of the other things. Um, this QR code is for Slack. Um, I for, well, I, this was, thank you to our sponsors. Oops, sorry, back, back one. Um, so we want to thank Forge for sponsoring. We want to thank uh, Five Tran for being willing to provide us with a speaker tonight and out here representing themselves. Um, remind everyone to join the Forge Slack. There's a data engineering channel that's pretty awesome. Like to say so myself. I spend some time there. Um, we are looking for additional speakers for the rest of the year. If you would like to speak, um, just hit me up on Slack. Um, there is an official call for papers for the meetup. If you'd like me to share that information with anybody, let me know. Um, and other than that, next month we have a meetup. It will be in person and we are going to be having community lightning talks. That means everybody can prepare a talk and bring it. The meetup will happen in Salt Lake. Um, we have a venue. Everything's going good um, with that and should be exciting. So tonight... We have Mark from Vivetran speaking to us about why we integrate data. Um, before I turn the time over to him, if you have any questions and you are comfortable with being recorded, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, just ask the question um, during his presentation. Um, if not, feel free to put it in the chat. I will ask the question and then uh, around 45 minutes, he'll kind of wrap up his presentation. I'll turn off the recording and then you can continue to ask questions off the recording record without that pressure, if you have any pressure. I know it affects things. So with that, um, Mark, uh, the time is now yours. All right, uh, thank you. Um... So let me share my screen. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, today, I wanted to talk about why we integrate data, and I specifically want to talk about use cases. Um, I work in the data integration space, and I've worked in the data integration space for all of my professional career. And um, <clears throat> I'm quite passionate about this, uh, this topic, and I think data integration use cases um, present themselves across all different industries, across all different companies, organizations. And what I'd like to do by presenting these different use cases today is to get everybody's juices flowing on thinking about innovative data integration use cases that could make sense for your organization. And then I'd, I'd specifically be interested in, and maybe we do this at the end of this presentation, if we uh, if we can share some some ideas on um, on 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 data use cases, data driven use cases for your organizations. Um, now, getting uh, moving on to the presentation. So, um, just quickly, my professional career. I started my professional career overseas, um, working at Oracle uh, Professional Services. This was quite literally uh, the previous uh, century. 
uh, when, when I did that. Uh, I then got the opportunity to move into product management at Oracle. I came to, uh, to the San Francisco Bay Area uh, over 20 years ago, worked in, um, in a, in, as a product manager for a technology called Oracle uh, Data Warehouse Builder. Um, uh, that was an ELT capability that Oracle provided at the time and then gradually moved into data warehousing at, uh, at Oracle as part of the data uh, database group. Um, then in 2008, I moved to a company called Golden Gate and I worked on the technology side in Golden Gate. Golden Gate is a data replication uh, company then moved, uh, when Golden Gate got acquired by Oracle, uh, left Oracle again for a product management function, uh, function at a company called Actian, where, where we uh, I was responsible for a, an analytical database called Vectorwise. Actian uh, was a reseller of HVR technology. HVR is data replication. And I got the opportunity to join HVR uh, in 2014 as at the time, the 12th employee. Um, and we managed to grow this company to about 150 employees when we got acquired by Fivetran in October of 2021. At HVR, I originally started as the first employee in the United States as in a bit of a general management function, gradually moved into a, into a CTO role and this transitioned into five trend where I'm currently field CTO. That means um, I evangelize technology and I try to prevent uh, uh, blockers from, 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 uh, from a technology perspective in data integration scenarios. So enough about me. I just wanted to go um, uh, around and talk about some data integration use cases. Now, when I think about data integration use cases and I look at the organizations that I have the opportunity to speak with, I see that organizations have essentially at a high level, three reasons why they look at data integration, uh, data integration use cases, and ultimately um, analytical um, uh, use cases. First of all, there are a lot of uh, use cases that have an internal focus, right? We we all, if we think about our organization, we all have a uh, have a desire to lower the cost of operating our organization. We want to improve efficiencies that can lead to lower costs, but it can also lead to to higher output. Um, we see use cases that are there to lower the risk of our organization. Then there's also analytical use cases that have an, uh, an external focus. Um, and those uh, external focuses uh, for, for those use cases are to increase revenues, to improve customer experience. Um, so, and of course, depending on the industry that we're in or depending on the, the organization that we represent, that means something different, right? If you're in healthcare, then the customer is maybe the, the patient. If you're in government, then the, uh, the customer might be the citizen, right? So when we're generally, generically talking about improving the, the customer experience, that means very different things for different organizations. And then the last one, why we integrate data and why we look for analytical use cases for, for um, let's say, consolidated data sets is because we want to build data products. Uh, we have access to a unique set of data. And with that access to or with the access to that data, we come up with products that are fundamentally data driven, that people have interest in, that organizations are interested in, and that uh, ultimately um, have value that, that, that we can sell. So um, again, I see those three uh, different use cases and th those use cases are, are typically around um, uh, <clears throat> uh, analytics, uh, right? So, so why do we integrate data is because we wanna have access to consolidated data sets and with those consolidated data sets, we have access to, or, or we can find, at the end of the day, needles in a haystack, we, we, we have an opportunity to, um, um, to use that data to our advantage. So um, let's go around a number of organizations and let's think about a financial institution. And let's consider the, 
uh, the, the, the use case of trading risk, right? As a financial institution, we trade maybe uh, securities and what can we do to limit the, 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 the trading risk? Um, <clears throat> so what kind of data sources uh, are there that the financial uh, services uh, organization is looking at? So there's lots of information that is that that feeds into uh, a trading risk. There are historical trades, right? We we know a lot about um, where the market is. We the 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 uh, trading analysts they do a lot of research into companies. They look at the the published numbers. They look at the uh, industry benchmarks. They look at historical trades, they look at current trades, they look at the, the client profile and their preferences, right? Like a, a, in trading risk and as a financial institution, if we make decisions on the basis of our clients, we take our client preferences into account. Um, we may look into social media. What is the, um, the sentiment on let's say a particular organization, if we chose to invest in um, in, in in a particular organization, so um, these are all kinds of uh, data sources that we want to consolidate in order to make the best trading decision at any moment in time, because ultimately we want to uh, limit the risk, we want to limit the exposure, and we want to make the right decision uh, for, um, uh, for our organization. So in financial services, this is a great use case that we, um, that, that we come across of why do we integrate uh, this data? We wanna simply minimize the risk for our uh, traders. Then let's think about oil and gas, right? Like the energy industry um, is, um, uh, is, 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 uh, is, is doing well recently. Uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, we, we, we all experienced, I think, as consumers that the cost of, uh, of, of filling up the, our tank at the gas pump uh, increased. Uh, there's a lot of demand for energy. So uh, of course, if you're in uh, if you're in the exploration uh, business and you're looking for oil and gas, um, what are some of the the considerations that you have? Right? You think about if if we look at this image, um, we think about a, 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 an oil platform and looking for oil is is an activity that has uh, quite high uh, investment uh, with it. You consider um, we need to go drill somewhere. What is what is the area where where are we most likely to be successful in finding oil? But then, as we go and we explore areas, think about the amount of investment that comes uh, that that comes into building a a platform like this. Right? You you go and uh, look for an environment, you look for an area where you think you're going to be successful, you're, you don't know ahead of time what you're going to run into, and well, <clears throat> how are you going to optimize the, the return on your investment for your organization? So if we look at the data sources that can help us be most successful in the exploration industry, we think about sensors, right? We, we go into, um, into the ocean, into the seas, we might go into, um, into the fields, into the, the, uh, the areas, we're going to drill for oil. And we get a lot of sensor generated data that comes back from those uh, from from the measurements that we're taking. So we take in those measurements. We take in a lot of observations. Um, we may have a very experienced um, uh, a very experienced team on the ground that is working the equipment, and they have their observations related to how they've gone through similar scenarios before. Uh, but then there's also a lot of reference data, right? Uh, imagine when we're drilling for oil and, and we're in a, in a deep, deep sea situation, 
uh, we're looking for oil and we, we may or may not be, a, be successful in finding it, but at the end of the day, we're, we're drilling and, and, and that operation in and of itself is relatively costly. And you can only imagine that out there uh, in, in the environment, things end up breaking. And every day that, let's say, we, we would have been able to make progress, but we can't because of missing parts, missing, um, missing pieces, um, that becomes a, a very big problem. So as we go and make a major investment for, uh, for, uh, for, for drilling for oil, as, as this particular example shows, we have to be very careful and make sure that we, that we avoid downtime in a situation like this. So what is our access to parts? What are the costs of the individual parts? How would we get them to the site where we're at in order to uh, be able to um, to to continue to uh, to to drive to to be productive in a situation like this, there's lots of um, information sources that that come together in a scenario like this. Now, thinking of the energy in industry, there's there's other examples. Uh, if if you consider like a utilities company, for example, uh, they may be going through. Um, and, and I think as as or as consumers we've we've seen this as well is uh, everybody has had a smart meter installed in the last 10 to 15 years and uh, the energy the utilities company is trying to pull the information from um, uh, from our uh, energy uh, usage and why do they do that is because they want to optimize the the spread of usage it's very difficult when you when you start relying on renewable resources you may not always have access to energy on demand so what they try to do is 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 find out what the energy usage is at any time of the day and ultimately um potentially prevent the uh, a, a, a multi-billion dollar investment in building another power plant in order to service our customers and meet our energy de demand. So in energy, whether it's in exploration or in, uh, in, in usage, there's lots of uh, reasons why we want to consolidate data. We want to know information from our customers about our usage. We want to know information about our consumers, uh, how many um, let's say uh, offices do we serve, et cetera, as what is the pattern of energy usage and how can we spread this in order to avoid multi-billion dollar investments. Likewise, as I, as I explained with this uh, oil and gas uh, use case, there's, there's in energy other reasons why we want to integrate data. So let's think about the challenges that a consumer uh, uh, product company uh, goes through. They have a, a product distribution cha uh, ch uh, challenge, a, a supply chain uh, challenge. We go to a local, a local grocery store and we expect the shelves to be filled with the products that, that we expect to buy at any one moment in time. Now behind that is a very complex problem of, um, of optimization of right? If we, if we think back to the early days of COVID, um, there were some challenges with the distribution of certain products, right? Like in uh, certainly in my local uh, grocery store, um, there was no toilet paper to be uh, to 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 be uh, bought at at that time, and that is a challenge. That is a problem. And as a CPG company, you try to prevent an issue, an out of stock issue, because ultimately, the 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 consumer product goods companies they work at relatively low margins, they want to be able to fulfill sales in order to drive volume and um, and, and ultimately meet the, the customer's demands so that they can be profitable. So how do you solve this problem? How do you figure out, how do you optimize the supply chain if as a CPG company, you are in charge of distributing your product to the point of sale? How, how do you optimize this? So think about some of these, the data sources, right? There is your, your ERP system um, uh, itself. You produce these products. Uh, so what comes off the production line? What inventory do you have in what particular location? Uh, from a distribution 
perspective, like what distribution capacity do you have? How does this product reach a point of sale? Ultimately, what are the weather conditions that might influence the demand for a particular product? Um, what is some of the sales data? What do you know about patterns of sales throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout the month, quarterly? Like how do they, these patterns evolve in a way that ultimately you can, uh, you can serve all your customers? These are very complex um, uh, data integration challenges that as a CPG company, you try to solve by getting the data from these different uh, sources, from these, um, these different environments, so that ultimately you have the best way uh, to serve these, um, these customers. Yeah. So now let's think about airlines, right? And airlines is, a, is an example, I think, of, a, of complex manufacturing or a, a, an industry where um, we, we serve transportation. So whether it's an airline or whether this is, um, this is for, uh, let's say, a transportation company, uh, or whether this is uh, even the CPG example, where if we if we supply our um, our stores ourselves, it could be a, a use case in that area. Um, so preventive maintenance. Now think about the airlines think, and think about some of the complexities that they have to solve in order to do preventive maintenance, right? Because we're we're talking about a a moving target in this case. So some of the data sources that are relevant in order to decide when and where to service an airplane, um, we have to consider flight data, right? Where is this airplane? Where is it originating? Where is it going to? When is it going to be in a, in a location where we can realistically uh, ser uh, service uh, the, the airplane? Um, there's passenger information, right? Like how many passengers, where are these passengers? Um, what if we had to use this airplane in um, as, a, as a backup uh, because there's, there's problems uh, with other aircraft that we, that we, that we need to um, uh, be a backup for? Uh, what is the maintenance history on this airplane? What are some of the uh, industry, uh, what does the vendor um, of this airplane, what do they specify as the the maintenance um, schedule uh, for the airplanes? And then, what's the availability of parts? What's the availability of engineers who can service this airplane? Um, how are we going to be able to service this airplane um, at the right time? Obviously, before it breaks down, and making sure that we have the right people, we have the right parts, we have everything at the right place at the right time in order to service the airplane. Now, of course, if you think about airlines, uh, preventive maintenance is one um, one scenario, but there's lots of other scenarios why the airline would want to integrate data because they want to serve uh, customers. They want to serve them as as good as they can. They have access to specific um, um, to, to gates at uh, at uh, 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 airfields, right at the airports. So um, <clears throat> they want to ultimately maximize the revenues. There's lots of optimization techniques around uh, pricing for flights and, and filling seats in an airplane. So there's lots of reasons there uh, why airline, airlines want to uh, consolidate data. So um, another example, right? If we, if we are a provider of gifts and experiences, and let's imagine that uh, there's multiple types of experiences that we provide. On the one hand, maybe we have a way to, um, to, to provide flowers, but maybe we also provide chocolates. And maybe we have certain experiences like spas that we are a provider for. Um, ultimately, what we, what we want to do is optimize the experiences and, and ultimately maximize our revenues. So if you consider a scenario like that, where there's potentially multiple brands involved, how do you do this, right? So uh, what, what information sources are relevant? Um, uh, first of all, of course, your customers, right? Like who are the people who buy these experiences? 
who do they buy them for? Um, how can you influence these customers uh, with a marketing strategy uh, for those customers? You think about um, uh, what do, uh, <coughs> uh, what kind of experiences at what time of the week, uh, what time of the month, right? Like what are these orders and what is the value of these orders? And, and the classic example is like, Okay, um, uh, you go on a blind date, and 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 you want you you want to make your blind date happy with the uh, with some flowers, but at the same time you 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 sweeten the deal for your for your partner and and buy them um, uh, chocolates, right? So the, the, there's there's kind of like uh, these kinds of scenarios that I wonder if um, if as a provider of gifts and, and experiences you, you you come across. And then of course there's sales, uh, there's sales data, there's sales information, of course. And if you think about the fulfillment of these um, uh, of these gifts and experiences, then of course the sales data is relevant because you have to make sure that you can fulfill these experiences and ultimately. Um, uh, create the best experience uh, for your customers in order to, to maximize your revenues. Different industry, right? Um, so let's, uh, let's think about entertainment, right? And let's think about an organization that provides um, entertainment to, um, uh, to consumers. Um, but there is access, there is the ability to have different, again, experiences, um, but uh, in the inter entertainment industry, we can think about gambling, we can think about restaurants, for example, um, there's all kinds of experiences that an entertainment company may have access to, and how can they ultimately uh, optimize the customer experience? So what are some of the data sources that, um, that are relevant in this case? Um, well, in the entertainment industry, and certainly if you think about gambling as one particular type of entertainment, the customer lifetime value becomes very important and it, it becomes um, a metric that you, um, that you want to uh, monitor and pay attention to because ultimately the customer lifetime value is the, is the revenue opportunity for your organization. But then you think about some of the recent experiences that, you, that they have. And again, going back to gambling and when it comes down to high stakes, um, they, they may have had a, 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 a shocking experience, positive or negative, and, um, and, and that may drive them to have a desire to for, for a, uh, a very specific other experience. And this is where you can ultimately optimize the lifetime experience of the, or the lifetime value of the customer uh, for your organization. So with, with the, the ability to have an overview of the different experiences and having a feel for let's say um, the, the location of, of where your customers are, you have uh, certainly uh, uh, opportunities to, to optimize the experience and to provide the best possible experience for the customers um, so that they ultimately keep coming back. So, um, and then uh, of course, if we think about the, the locality of those different experiences, are those available? What is an expected return on investment, right? Let's say that somebody just had a relatively big loss. Uh, we noticed that they, they, they are very close to a restaurant. So maybe we offer them a, um, a free meal at the restaurant as a, in, in, in order to, uh, to, to, to kind of diminish the, the, the bad experience they had when they had the significant loss. So uh, those are all kinds of experiences that well, or all kinds of data sources that if you think about optimizing a customer experience, um, as an entertainment company, these are um, uh, ways that you can uh, that you can optimize the experience for your customers. Let's go into a completely different um, industry and let's think about the uh, the medical devices uh, and and let's consider like of course these are uh, complex machines. 
and, um, and, and, and imagine that we want to optimize customer support, right? Like uh, our customers would be uh, hospitals uh, or, or healthcare organizations that may be buy in bulk. And, um, and, and, and they want their equipment to work, right? Like in, in some cases, we may be talking about life and death uh, situations in this case. And we want to make sure that, um, that our uh, equipment works. Now, how can we optimize the customer support experience for our, um, uh, for our customers in the, uh, in, if, if, if we're in the world of medical devices? So um, now with this, uh, with this, these complex machines, we, we have to think about like, okay, what, what does this mean from a manufacturing perspective, right? Uh, so when, uh, when we think about customer support and we think about these machines might fail, we have to uh, uh, deliver parts, we have to build these parts, we have to produce them. Uh, when we think about manufacturing, Manufacturing is a is a complex process, uh, very physical, um, and uh, every time we adjust the manufacturing production line, um, until we get to fully three D printing everything, uh, we have to uh, make some significant adjustments, and those adjustments uh, require some downtime. But then, of course, if we if we're willing to take the downtime to produce different parts, maybe we should build additional parts. And then what does that mean uh, from an inventory perspective? Where are we gonna store uh, the surplus parts that we may be producing? When do we expect those to be, um, to be used? There's a lot of complex uh, optimization uh, problems that we need to deal with. So let's think about some of the data sources that a medical device manufacturer would go through. So they think about, of course, the procurement side, right? Like if we if we have to manufacture devices, we need resources. And will we have enough resources? Of course, if we think about the, the, the challenge of optimizing the, the efficiency from a production line perspective, we have to, of course, consider the upstream feeds into that production line. If we do not have the resources, we can we, we cannot produce our parts, we cannot produce our machines. We have to think about the sales orders. How much are we selling? How, how many of these individual parts that we create are we going to need to fulfill our sales orders versus um, servicing um, uh, equipment that's out there that, 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 that needs service? Um, the, the manufacturing side, there's the inventory side. Where do we store produced uh, machines? Where do we store? The individual parts. How can we distribute them? What is the logistics of this? Um, how can we transport them? Who are we going to use to transport these um, equipment? May be produced in one side of the earth needs to go to the other side of the earth. How long is it going to take? How long uh, can we uh, can we take? And then from a servicing perspective, of course, do we have the right engineers available at the right time in order to, to service these machines in a way that we can ultimately uh, minimize the downtime for these devices? Because ultimately, um, customer support, patients, uh, it, it, it may be a case of life and death for, for uh, the people who are affected uh, when the machine does not, um, just does not function properly. Okay, let's think about uh, global shipping and mailing, right? Uh, tracking and delivery uh, as a consumer and um, I suppose uh, in the United States, it's very common that we uh, that we order our items uh, online, and then of course we want to know is where are my items, um, where and the um, uh, when can I expect my items to get delivered? Now, of course, this happens at a very large scale and um, with incredibly many packages and and, and mailing items at, at any point in time. Now, if you are in the business of global shipping and mailing, um, how do you service this? Uh, how can you uh, uh, optimize this tracking? How can you make sure that the, delivery, that the delivery takes place when you predict it's going to happen? And what can you do to optimize this? Because ultimately, if you're managing um, shipping and mailing, 
then of course there's there's a significant cost in managing this. Uh, again, you can only imagine this is relatively low margin. You want to optimize the efficiency, but also you want to be as reliable as possible because ultimately I can only imagine that there's very large contracts involved in order to become the, the dedicated shipping company for a particular um let's say office or building or uh, you you become the the provider of choice for consumers so how do you optimize this how can you maximize this so uh, what are some of the data sources that, that that are relevant to you right like there's there's of course a lot of location data uh, involved here there's lots of spatial problems that we try to um that we try to address specifically if you think about shipping right like and then you, the, the traffic conditions become relevant there may be a decision point in the choice of transportation for any particular item and again we're talking about items uh, handling in bulk um, information about the package right like what are the dimensions what's the weight uh, how can we optimize the the distribution of this when we think about where it needs to go, how we're going to get it there, and um, and 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 what does that mean from a from a handling perspective, right? The the handling measurements. If you think about um, packages, uh, shipping items, they may they go through facilities. Are there any bottlenecks in these facilities? And if there are, what can you do to uh, remove them so that ultimately you can provide a better experience? and you can provide that very predictive um, tracking uh, in order to fulfill that delivery. So uh, there's all kinds of interesting data sources there to, uh, to, to address this particular use case. So, and then um, one more example in complex manufacturing is, um, is a locomotive. Right, like, and this is an an, an, an example where um, uh, specifically, like I mentioned, in uh, when I when I started this presentation, I said, look, there's there's internal uh, data sources, there's external uh, data sources, and we've seen some examples of each of these, and um, and in this particular example, I want to specifically talk toward uh, developing a data product, right? Like, this is. Um, this is again um, a manufacturing use case. We're talking about locomotives as a as an example, and ultimately, uh, for a railroad company who is the the consumer of this locomotive or the, the the user of this locomotive, ultimately for them, the average speed at which the locomotive operates is going to uh, determine the 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 value of this um, of this complex piece of equipment so if you're an organization that is um, that manufactures these locomotives that provides these locomotives uh, to your to the to the railroads what can you do to optimize the utilization uh, or to uh, what can you do to to uh, maximize the average speed at at which the um, the railroad company can can operate the locomotive, and what can you do uh, to maximize this? Now, um, you think about this, right? Like, and you think about modern manufacturing, and you think about uh, the the uh, the um, uh, the popularity of Internet of Things, right? Sensor generated data. Um, this all became part of complex uh, equipment, such as a locomotive like this, right? So you have all kinds of sensor generated data, and this sensor generated data can become the basis for helping uh, maximize the, uh, the, 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 the average speed of operating the locomotive. There are, of course, certain measurements and um, and experiences that you, as a as a manufacturer of this piece of equipment, can provide to your customers, to your users, to the railroad companies. What's the oper the, the 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 optimal operating temperature of the locomotive? Right, like how can they best operate this to minimize the damage to the individual parts? You take the measurements, you provide insight to your customers, to those measurements, so that they can get a feel for 
what is the, the, the best way to operate the piece of machinery. And also similar to the medical device example that I used, how can we then do uh, uh, the, the maintenance or the airline example, uh, the preventive maintenance at the right time? If we think about like, okay, we're again, working with uh, uh, literally a moving target here, we need service or we know we're going to need service for this piece of equipment within the next three weeks. Um, we need the part there. We need the engineer there. We need to be in a location where the, the, the moving target is at that point in time. Um, all these things need to come together with, again, ultimately the goal is to optimize the or to maximize the maximum speed at which this device operate operates uh, or this piece of machinery. So um, so what are some of the data sources, right, that are relevant uh, for this case if you're the manufacturer, uh, the provider of these locomotives? Um, so sensors, right, um, lots of sen sensor-generated data that is built into the locomotive. Then there's production data with, again, some of the complexities around producing the parts, making sure the supply chain is is um, is is there to de to deliver the resources, but also to distribute the parts, knowing where they need to go to from a planning and scheduling perspective. If you also service, right? If you're the manufacturer of, of the locomotives and you also service these locomotives, you have to have the engineers in the right place uh, when the locomotive is available. So there's all of this location data that becomes relevant. There might be information about the geography um, that is relevant to the customers, right? Like, are we good? When are we going uphill, downhill? Uh, what does that mean for, let's say, the, the damage to the brakes that we're causing at any point in time, some of the wear and tear on the uh, on the equipment? What does that mean ultimately of how can we best route um, our, um, our uh, locomotives um, to, uh, first of all, avoid the bottlenecks, but also to minimize the damage? There's a lot of, um, I, I think, interesting uh, data sources there that are relevant for um uh for, for for this example so um so anyway so uh, those are some of the examples that i wanted to cover today so um just to summarize right if we if we think about like why do we integrate data um we spoke about uh, the fact that there's uh, internal sources right let me just go back to uh, the earlier slide sorry about that so um so why do we want to integrate data there's there's use cases that we spoke about that have an internal focus where we want to lower some of our costs and we want to improve efficiencies and maybe um lower the risks um, there is use cases around there, uh, some of which I covered for, with an external focus to increase revenues, improve customer experiences. And then lastly, um, an example uh, where we can uh, genuinely build data products where we have access to data as a provider and we want to um, um, make that data available to our customers that, and, and ultimately there is, uh, there is value there for our customers in, in ways that they can, they can optimize the, the usage of, of the products or the services that we provide. So, um, again, the, the goal of this presentation was to get some of the juices flowing. So hopefully uh, you thought about some of what this could mean to your organization. So I want to open it up for Q&A and, and a discussion and see if, um, if maybe someone can speak about some of the, the use cases that you see in your organization. So um, thank you and um, thank you for, um, for attending this session. Do we do like a silent clap when we do these remote sessions, right? Like, thank you so much for that. Um, I'll kick off questions real quick. I had one. Um, oh, there's clap emojis. We've got some clap emojis. So thank you so much. Um, you. When you've been dealing with um, customers, I, I guess, how much of this um, data integration do you see being used for like analytics or understanding um, the benefits of the product versus being directly used to make business decisions in the product, right? I like 
is that something you feel like you can answer? I feel like a lot of people see external sources for analytics and sometimes struggle to see external sources for some of the product use cases. So I'm curious what you've seen. Yeah, so so I think the uh, so I think a lot of the use cases that we've seen in the last uh, decade or maybe a couple of decades uh, are analytical use cases. And certainly more recently, I think the analytical use cases have, have, have very much taken off. And, and part of the reason why we've seen that is because the, the ability to, um, uh, to, to get access to technologies that can deliver analytics at scale, whether that is high scale or relatively low scale, has significantly improved, right? Like, and we, we could talk about the, the role the cloud has played in this and, and, and kind of like consumption-based pricing, those kinds of, um, of reasons where traditionally um, with the, the some of the more traditional technologies, a significant investment, an upfront investment would have been required into an on-prem data center. And based on simply the, the cost model of that, um, analytics wasn't always accessible to everybody, but with the cloud and with consumption-based pricing, it's become uh, a lot more um, uh, a, like possible for, for organizations of literally any size to be able to uh, unlock some of those analytical use cases. Now, um, now, where where do you, do you then go for internal and external sources? Like, I think so. I think analytical uh, use cases are certainly a very popular use case for for data integration these days. Um, when I look at some of the conversations that I have with customers, we see probably. Um, eight to nine out of 10 are analytical use cases. Some of that might simply be driven by uh, kind of the, 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 the business that we play in, but there's also use cases that are more around operational use cases. Uh, I think um, if you consider the CPG example that I uh, discussed, that is uh, certainly more of an operational use case. Uh, even in the in the in the financial uh, industries use case, right? The trading example that I use, that's arguably uh, somewhat more of a of an operational use case. Um, uh, now, where do I see the integration? So there is the 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 forward integration into an analytical uh, system, and then there is the. the I think the, the the kind of technology that that that, that we see out there, uh, which is more talking about, uh, I would say reverse ETL is 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 a term that is commonly used, where you've done some analysis, maybe you've run through a predictive modeling, and the outcome of that you want to feed that back into your operational systems. And I think we look at operational systems often as uh, as data silos. And uh, what we so uh, so the why do we integrate data is to consolidate the data, but then we again integrate it or we we move it uh, in or into these operational systems in order to then maybe take the action or take the next step uh, based on the conclusion that we drew from an analytical uh, use case. So. I, I hope, uh, Mariah, that kind of uh, answers the question. Uh, for sure. For sure. Um, does anybody else have a question? Feel free to put them in the chat and I can read them out. We do have a, uh, some things I'm going to save for after the recording, um, just for, um, I don't know if privacy or whatever is the right use case for that. Oh, Joe's got one. Thanks for joining, Joe. Um, it's what are some anti patterns uh, that you've seen probably for integration or data integration? Uh, anti patterns for data integration. Well, that's a that's an interesting question. Um, so an anti pattern would also like would arguably be a um, a pattern where you decide to split data, right? Or you isolate data. And I think if I think about like, what is the, what is really a use case, like an anti-pattern? And I'd say, well, it's it's almost related to, uh, to data distribution based on 
let's say if we're a data provider and we sell some of the data sources, depending on on kind of the data, the, the kind of data that somebody buys into, they get access to only the, the slides that they pay for. Um, it, it's it's I don't know that there's really an anti-pattern to data integration that comes into play. It's it's maybe like a a, a limited view on data. I think uh, when I think about this question, Joe, uh, about the anti-pattern, uh, I think about um, or the, I think about a multi-tenancy kind of environment where we want to limit the view of, 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 of the data that somebody has. And I'm not sure that there is really a true anti-pattern there as opposed to, well, we just provide a different view on, on the data. If the data does eventually get shipped out to a customer, then there is arguably an anti-pattern there. But would you would you consider that to fall under the umbrella of data integration? If you if you look at data integration from from the point of view of really data movement, or if you look at data integration is is is, is consolidation. Well, if it's if it's the the former, then it's arguably another data integration use case. If it's the latter, then it's arguably an anti-pattern of, of data integration. Uh, thank you. Makes sense. Uh, I have a question. What, what are you using data contracts? This is a, a, a vogue term right now, um, and it has to deal with the uh, integrating data. I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts on uh, data contracts. Uh, data contracts, uh, like you, are you, um, do you consider this from the point of view of like an organization needing access to data and they, they pay for it or um, can, can you clarify a little, little bit more? So, so data contracts, uh, I, I guess, from the, the viewpoint of ensuring semantic, um, uh, I guess, integrity um, from point A to B, right? So. Uh, addressing schema changes and, and various things. I'm sure you deal with it by trend, right? True. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so there is, so there's, there's, yeah. So there, there's absolutely uh, <laughs> several points of view uh, there. So, so first of all, I think, and, and this goes, this ultimately uh, goes down to like some of the, the technology choices that, that, that you all could decide you're, you're going to make. Uh, but there is um, there is the point of view that, of course, depending on the data source, you want to provide the the, the representation that the data source provides in as raw of a form as possible to best match what the data source provides, right? Like, and then we could think about like, okay, data lakes um, and 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 all versus data warehouses and and some of these terms come to mind. But then from from that point of view, if you think about the data model, you want to be able to follow the data model as as carefully as possible. Now. If you look at database uh, on the database side, well, then on the database side, there's there's table changes, and you can follow these. If you think about this from a from a software as a service perspective, it's the APIs that de determine what the data looks like. If you think about it from a sensor generation point of view, it's like the definition of of let's say the record that comes out of that model, and and you want to follow that as as carefully as possible. Now, th there is a point when you talk about data contracts that I think is also relevant to mention is like the data quality of it, right? Like how do you ensure or what, uh, what, what have you put in place to ensure that the data is the correct representation of the data? And in case of interruptions, and I think with data integration and with cloud, and well, we, we saw numerous examples of moving targets when we're, when we're considering uh, pulling data off of, of machinery that, that goes around is like, what, what, are you, what are you going to do to make sure that your solution is resilient, that you don't miss any data sets, and, but also um, there's no overlap in the data that uh, comes across. And that is, a, I think, a, a, an umbrella that we talk about uh, inside of Fivetran is, is the concept of data trust. And we want to make sure that uh, the organizations have uh, trust in their data. And some techniques that come to mind as it relates to that are um, 
auditing techniques to be able to validate like, okay, we, we saw so many changes on the source. Um, we want to be able to validate that we, that we indeed um, uh, uh, integrated so many changes on the destination. There's, so there's some auditing there. Ultimately though, the, uh, the, the best approach to validate the data is to do a, a separate validation of the data. Now, I do I do want to to distinguish uh, some what I would call relatively low quality data sources from from high quality data sources and and this is um, by, by this is by no means meant to be disrespectful but if we think about let's say we're measuring the the, the thickness of our disk breaks right like and 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 there is a data point that we get every minute and we receive that data point. That is, I would call that a relatively low value data point. And the reason why I, I call it that way is because first of all, it's a very simple data point, right? right? Like it's, a, it's very simple data, it's, it's not complex. It's like, okay, here's the measurement, this is the time, and this is the measurement, right? Like in every minute you get that data point. This is the time, this is the measurement. It's relatively low quality because if let's say, in over the course of an hour, we miss a couple of data points, it's not the end of the world, right? We're we're looking, we're monitoring data points, but also every data point is a new record. Now, if we compare and contrast that with let's say CRM type data where we have customer information and the customer information changes, uh, that I would call the customer data, the CRM data, uh, an example of very high value data because it's, very relevant that we that we record every data change. If, if, if in our CRM system we keep track of our sales orders, well, if we if we miss a sales order, that that's kind of a big deal, right? But if the sales order subsequently changes, we also want to make sure that we track that information. So it's it's not just um, the um, it's not always just a new data point it may be an, a, a change to an existing data point it may be a removal of a data point so there's more complex operations there so ultimately then the trust of the data what it boils down to for for high high value data sources is can we validate the data in a way to make sure that, like in a separate way outside of the way we move the data to be able to validate that the data is in fact correct. So let's say if it was a database, can we just do a run a select against the source table, run a select against the, the destination table and validate, compare the data sets and make sure that the data is in fact correct. And from a, from a data contract perspective, indeed that we delivered the right data. So I hope Joe, that gives you a, um, a an, an answer to your question, like what what my point of view is on on, on data contracts. Yeah, much appreciated. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. You're up, Todd. Okay. So uh, you went over a lot of different data sources, and I think obviously different data sources will be relevant for different use cases, but. Uh, who in your perspective should own all of the data sources and the process of making them into data products for whatever the use case that they're going to be used for is? <laughs> I know that's open-ended. Yeah, that's a, that's a very open-ended question. And I think what, <clears throat> well, what I see is that a lot of organizations end up with a with the data engineering team that, that, is, going to, that, that is going to help unlock uh, the, 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 the data sources. Now, I think, so you, you bring up a very good point, which is the point of governance, right? Like who makes sure that we can actually access this data and how do you ultimately um, ensure that the data you use is used appropriately and let's say we're not suddenly, um, if, if, if let's say we unlock our HR data as an example, that not suddenly the entire company has access to the salary information across the entire company. That's likely in most organizations, not a good idea. Um, so so the, the point of governance is absolutely very relevant and, and who is then deciding uh, the, the access to the systems it can be an analytics team. I think ultimately the 
the, the owners of the data sources are going to need to provide the credentials and set the rules around the, uh, the, the, the extraction uh, of the data or the integration of the data, the use of that data further downstream. Uh, I do think that there is a, that there's lots of opportunity here in um, in in in, uh, in in data management in general, where uh, for organizations to um, or for let's say um, um, uh, providers uh, to to develop products uh, in this area, there's uh, cataloging that comes to mind that organizations do in order to make sure that there is governance around the data to make sure that uh, people who are not supposed to have access to the data, that they don't have um, access. Um, so um, Todd, maybe just to, to summarize, I think ultimately who decides the access to the source, it's the, um, it's the owner of the system, right? Or the, the organization that, that ultimately de de defines the ownership. Uh, I see that there's a lot of data engineering teams. There's lots of organizations with uh, analytical teams who who provide who help analytics for the for the ultimately for the users. And then we try to get more and more into self-service analytics for these organizations. So I I hope that gives you uh, some sort of a perspective. And then from a cataloging perspective, there's there's technologies that come to mind like Calibra, like uh, Atlan, um, those kinds of um, those kinds of um, tools and, and technologies. Matches a, little, a lot of what I see, so yeah, I, I can resonate with that. Thank you for your question. Do we have any other questions? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end the recording with that. Thank you again, Mark.